You know, it's such a crying shame when you hear when some games, most often with months, if not years of resources poured into them, are cancelled. But that's not always the end of the line for some of them. While a few are thankfully leaked onto the internet over time, some developers are even more resourceful little fellas and find a way to include the spoiled fruits of their many long sleepless nights into later projects for us to secretly enjoy. So this episode we take a look at these countermanded compositions, these annulled annexations and these invalidated increments. As I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five council games you can play, hidden in fully released games. Yeah! Rayman 2 was really the Skyrim of the 90s, as in the game was ported to pretty much everything at the time even the system's not out for another 12 years. But that's probably due to how much money Ubisoft threw at developing a 3D platformer back then, still trying to claw back their monies decades later. Now, the follow-up to everyone's favourite quadriplegic Frenchman was originally meant to be an improved version of Rayman 1, a nicer looking 2D platformer that addressed a lot of the complaints of the original, such as its brutal difficulty and, ironically, way too easy puzzles, and was pretty far in development when the boys from Montreal decided to can the game so they could jump into the third dimension. Why was it cancelled? Well, all because of one game, Crash Bandicoot. When Ubisoft saw what Naughty Dog were doing with their game at the 1996 E3, they immediately scrapped the original 2D Rayman 2 and began development on a title that would beat the Antipodean marsupial in every department. However, the original development team didn't want their years of hard work going to waste. So, with an almost complete game scrapped, they cleverly hid some of the best levels they had created in the 3D Rayman 2, which you can unlock by collecting 720 of the 800 yellow lums hidden in the game, then finishing the Crow's Nest level. It's not the full game, sadly, but you never know. With Ubisoft now starting to remaster a lot of their back catalogue, the original Rayman 2 may still see the light of day making this episode about four cancelled games and one heavily delayed one. Brilliant. I'll have to change the thumbnail then. <laughs> now, this entry is quite the oddity. EA's NBA Live 95 has the perplexing ability to play a secret golf game on a basketball title. This simple notion as to why confused gamers for decades, but actually there's quite a simple explanation. After the total dumpster fire that was the first two Madden games on the Super Nintendo, EA decided to let development studios pitch their skills on future iterations of their sports franchises. <laughs> if they're not closing studios, they're having them battle to the d bankruptcy. <laughs> and one of the jobs on offer was for the next edition of their PGA Tour series. This is where development studio Hitmen Productions comes in. They had already gotten the job of developing the NBA Live series on the Mega Drive slash Genesis that year, and had also developed the rather impressive PGA Tour 486 on PC. Hitmen wanted to prove to EA they could port their highly praised PC title to Sega's 16-bit console, so created part of the game to show them what it would look like. However, in typical EA incompetence, and despite dwindling review scores of previous PGA games, EA, in their infinite wisdom, decided to leave development of the fourth title, PGA European Tour, with the same developers, Polygames. So, not wanting their work to go to waste, 
Hitsmen squeezed their pitched game down into some remaining space they had on the NBA Live 95 card as a nice little easter egg for their players, which you can access by simply entering reflog, that's golfer backwards, in the name entry screen. This story also has a silver lining. PGA European Tour received such terrible review scores, Hitsmen Productions would receive the commission to make the following year's edition, PGA Tour 96, which looks quite similar graphically to the hidden game. Not only that, they were also hired to develop the PC, 3DO and PlayStation 1 versions too. So I guess charity does have its own rewards. <laughs> Despite having the impressive pedigree of being developed by Midway, Trog seems to be largely forgotten in the annals of gaming history. Quite possibly as is essentially a four-player Pac-Man knockoff with some nice claymation sprites, which in all honesty by 1990 was considered old hats that no one gave a toss about. However, Trog was never meant to be a Namco mascot wannabe whatsoever. The original premise was quite a novel one. You guide your chosen Lisa Simpson resembling extinct reptile around the screen to collect eggs, while avoiding obstacles and cycloptic cavemen. Though rather than control the dinosaur directly, you place bones in their path to redirect them, and being a four player game, could be quite fun screwing over the other players by placing bones in their paths too. It sounds more like something along the lines of Choo Choo Rockets or Lemmings, but this was long before either of those two titles ever existed. Sadly, Midway just couldn't get the concept to click. Playtesters either couldn't get their head around the notion, or just found the whole thing boring. The Big M knew they were developing a potential stinker, but they had ploughed way too much money into the game to cancel it. So, as a last ditch effort, rejig the game where you directly control the dinosaurs now, ultimately turning it into a more generic clone of everyone's favourite labyrinthine pellet gobbler. In fact, side by side, you'd be hard pressed to see any differences without playing the thing, with its only notable disparity being you control a hand which constantly asks you to bash the bone button on screen. Legend has it that one of the location test machines also had a kid carve an R at the end of all the bone button labels on the joysticks, which was another reason the game was changed, apparently. The development team must have liked the original concept still, as they kept it hidden on the motherboard right up until the fifth revision of the game, where Midway decided they didn't like the idea of arcade owners getting a free game. And obviously, the home ports never featured it either. Though the NES version's developer, Visual Concepts, like the idea of claymation characters so much, they go on to create the infamous Clay Fighter three years later. But it's still fascinating to be able to play a game that was originally meant to be something completely different. The mass popularity of Mario Kart over the years has sadly thrown Nintendo's second big racing IP, F-Zero, in the pits. Heck, the Big N haven't developed an entry in the franchise in-house since its Nintendo 64 iteration. Luckily, Sega grabbed the reins for the most recent home console release, co-developing both a port for the GameCube and an arcade version for their collaboration with Namco. However, it seems Sega originally intended to release both versions at home, or at least offer the arcade version as an unlockable bonus. Unfortunately, it seems they just couldn't get the game running properly on a bog standard retail GameCube. Maybe the arcade version used more RAM, but the game on the disc is playable still, it's just a rather butchered port. Now, there's no normal way to play the arcade version of F-Zero AX. Sega made it impossible to reach by any traditional means. However, anyone owning a GameCube action replay can play it to their slightly frustrated heart's content. The most bizarre thing here is Sega legitimately tried to make it playable on several occasions. 
Both the later US and European releases of F-Zero GX have had the arcade code altered slightly, showing that Sega were trying to get it to work, but sadly just didn't have the time or resources to accomplish this. However, it's still quite fun being able to play something we were never meant to see, even if it was the last F-Zero game we've yet to receive. And yes, I look forward to Nintendo announcing a new F-Zero game 10 seconds after this video goes up and endlessly receiving You Forgot comments in this video for the rest of time. So apologies in advance that my flux capacitor's on the fritz. I blew in love Twisted Metal as a teenager. I was obsessed with it, even sending drawings of it into gaming magazines. And while we were royally screwed over for the sequels in Europe, well, nothing that a friendly importer and a blob of blue tack would remedy, <laughs> learning there were impressive follow-ups on the horizon that were cancelled globally was just as heartbreaking. But enter Twisted Metal head-on, one of the unsung heroes of the PSP and the true successor to the all-time classic Twisted Metal 2. Well, as long as you don't count those god-awful 989 Studio sequels, or Road Trip Vacation 2012, that is. Unfortunately, no bugger bought the thing, so Sony ended up re-releasing it on the PS2 a year later as Twisted Metal Head-On Extra Twisted Edition, again in the US only. But Head-On's re-release could also be because the intended PS2 Twisted Metal ended up being cancelled. But to our surprise, being cancelled didn't stop us playing it. Oh no! Tucked in with the extra Twisted Edition is what remains of Twisted Metal Harbour City, a rather enthusiastic attempt to merge the car combat genre with Grand Theft Auto. It featured some of the intended car combat sequences in a zoned arena, a couple of new characters like a headless stock car driver, and a rather impressive on-foot mode repurposed to a museum collectathon of the franchise's history. Strangely, rather than advertise this concept as a chance to play a cancelled game, something incredibly novel in the games industry, they bizarrely changed the narrative to Harbour City, or Twisted Metal Lost, as they refer to it, being cancelled after several of the development staff were killed in a plane crash, and were reluctantly only releasing it under threats of violence. However, unbeknownst to the developers, there was an actual plane crash the day they mentioned, March 13th, 2005. A doctor and his two children tragically lost their lives falling into a forest in Ohio, making their intentionally dark story rather poor taste in hindsight. Ultimately, the story and the cancelled game's inclusion was a kind of meta-promotion to secretly announce the development of a PS3 Twisted Metal game which itself was almost cancelled on several occasions before sadly being sputtered out quietly in 2012. It's a shame Twisted Metal Harbour City was cancelled, as the concept sounded fantastic. Judging at what they had created, it was possibly a little too taxing for the PS2 to handle, but Midway, of all publishers, did prove it was feasible to merge the two genres together with Roadkill, an awesome overlooked gem for the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. But Extra Twisted Edition is a great example of, just because a game is cancelled, doesn't mean it has to be buried in a programmer's attic for the rest of eternity. Get it to a playable state, and maybe a few warnings of potential bugs, and gamers will love you forever. If only other publishers would follow suit. Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes, click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes! And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon, where you can not only see Fact Hunt episodes early, but also completely ad and sponsorship free! But thank you ever so much again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time! Tara for now.